So with that, I am so pleased to um, welcome this next panel uh, for a bunch of reasons. First of all, uh, Tara Pierce was a um, member of our first uh, Earth Law Summer Class cohort. Um, Lucy Ward was a member of our second Summer Class cohort. Uh, they're now working uh, extensively with Melody Brenna, who um, might I might someday refer to as my first Earth Law client. Um, though uh, at present, um, we're just working together to develop um, practical solutions to the degradation of the oceans. I'm also going to introduce Guyon, uh, Brenna, um, a part of the IntelliBrief's um, practical applications team. And uh, what I've learned is that um, it's indispensable to have practical, uh, uh, an assessment of the practical application, whether it's law, whether it's nanotechnology, as we've learned, uh, to put law on the books is far, far, far from the end of the process. We need to implement them. We need to enforce them. We need to be practical about how we can build on these frameworks, whether they're legal frameworks or nanotechnology frameworks for ocean restoration. So I'll turn that over to Melody to introduce uh, her panel and the speakers. You might be on mute, Mel. Okay. <laughs> okay, good morning uh, or afternoon or evening or wherever you are in your day today. I am mesmerized by the rights of nature and all the things I'm hearing from each one of you and the struggle to figure out this time is of the essence. How can we, in this we scientific decade, which was started six years ago, and it's ending soon, and we haven't done our job of uh, putting real protections to nature. And our company, Intella Reefs, sprang from requests from coral researchers all over the world. Um, the first university that had our products was um, University of Hawaii. And if any of you all saw the movie Chasing Coral, you would have seen a marvelous ocean biologist named Ruth Gates. And it was in her lab in Hawaii. And she said, Melody, I wish we had a ring around the prolific reefs in Hawaii today because the spawn are already leaving, the water's too hot, and this was in 2015. So uh, we have made discoveries of how can mother nature heal herself? How can you give mother nature a tool? Whether it's kelp or seaweed or corals or fish or sponges, how can you give this habitat back? Lucy, if you wanna take the next bit, that would be lovely. We do have Tara who's got the end of it with this unimaginably cool ocean farming. And we do have Kat Hickey, who's gonna go super in depth of seaweed and kelp. So thank you everybody. Go ahead, Lucy. Thank you so much, Mel, for that introduction. Um, and yeah, so at the Reef Life Foundation, as Mel says, we let Mother Nature take the lead. Rather than trying to take control of nature or manipulate her, we're giving her the tools to heal herself. Uh, we're firm believers that restoring nature restores humanity. Uh, and as we've already touched on quite heavily, we are deeply connected with nature um, and we should be giving her these tools that she needs. So within our science division in Tele Reefs, we have developed and tested a nanotechnology substrate that can be cast in any design and scaled up to meet the needs of an ecosystem. So 20 years of research and development have yielded Oceanite. 
which you can see here on the screen in a little bit more detail. Uh, it's a unique mineral mixture that allows artificial reefs to be fine tuned and customized right down to the nanoscale to support specific sites and species. Um, the complex system of pores within the oceanite creates a uh, much more surface area per square inch, uh, which really optimizes animal settlement. You can really see that there with the, the picture on the screen. You can see all of the, the nooks and crannies and the crevices and how great it will be for coral to be able to really hang on to it. Um, so unlike a lot of other artificial reef systems, oceanite uh, features a pH of 8.1, which is the same as natural ambient seawater. Uh, this avoids a uh, really dangerous and lengthy process called off-gassing, unlike a lot of other artificial reef systems, which happens when you place them in the water. Uh, this process takes years and can really harm sensitive animal tissues. So as you can see on this slide, there is five key benefits of oceanite-powered and tele-reef systems. Uh, our intelli structures provide firstly out planters with a really reliable place to plant coral that's already been grown that they can hang on to. Uh, and then secondly, a welcoming substrate that attracts wild coral actively. Um, and once it's they've been attracted, it provides a really high volume of uh, immediately available surface for these corals to grow up. And then once they're established, it provides the necessary levels uh, of shade for them to last. And then finally, Oceanite provides the ability to scale up um, to the huge scales that we need to meet the needs of nature and humanity. And all of this is done within the timescales that are realistic for the current um, state of our oceans and the rate that's needed to create real and impactful change. So you can see here that Oceanite has been deployed in two key areas in our flag flagship projects uh, in St. Martin and over in Halifax. In Halifax, we've tested the substrate for its abilities to develop and support healthy kelp communities. We placed 16 oceanite structures in a really degraded harbour in Halifax uh, and saw completely unprecedented results. The heavily degraded harbour now ha houses a, a kelp forest, which supports a variety of species like hermit crabs and sea stars. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit more as what has already been mentioned. Uh, then over in St. Martin, we deployed Oceanite at three pilot sites, and within 14 months of this deployment, there was a 400% increase in biodiversity, with a nearly 100% coverage. Uh, the wild coral was established, and fish were feeding on the reefs every 15 seconds. This is about four times higher than other healthy natural reefs and artificial reefs using the same methods. Um, so that's a super brief overview of why Oceanite is so awesome. Uh, and I'll now pass it back to Mel really briefly before it then goes onwards. Thank you very much. It's, it has been interesting to us um, to treat this from a nanoscale, from the tiniest, tiniest particle. And how can we put natural minerals into a matrix that the fish and all the creatures that were in that area or are coming from other areas seeking both sound and light and color and the fact that the biodiversity is so heavy so rapidly. And this is one reason why we were the first and are still the only endorsed substrate with the UN. We have been turning our science into the UN since we initially did at uh, University of Hawaii in 2015. So they get a science update from us all the time. And our mission, now that we can see that it works, is to plant a million miles of this and think of it in a massive scale. Um, the fact that we can precede these elements in a coral and fish lab is what we were looking at in Halifax. And Canadian researchers have had two years of our materials in big tanks where they could spray sugar kelp, bull kelp, this kind of seaweed, that type of fish spore that is lacking, precede them and then put them out all over the estuaries and springs that flow through Canada on either side. Um, Kat is going to discuss these pictures with us real quick, but the great part of seeing this go in the water and then having a camera come back is the surprise of how many species 
have gone to this substrate that really shouldn't have even been there. We did do eDNA testing and you guys can get back to me. We will show you the eDNA testing, which we took syringes on top of these. So you can actually see what endangered species are where and how they came to be attracted to this. And Kat, why don't you give us an overview of what seaweed is anyway? Do you have your mic? Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry are you about there? That. Good. Okay, hi, I'm Kat. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kelp um, and seaweed and oceanite. So um, kelp is a brown algae, also known as phyophyce and one of the largest species of marine macroalgae, commonly referred to as seaweed. Um, while kelp may exhibit certain visual similarities to land plants, its anatomical functions differ significantly. Unlike land plants, kelps do not possess roots. Instead, they rely on a unique structure called holdfasts to secure and anchor themselves onto hard, rocky surfaces. Although holdfasts serve a similar purpose to roots like land plants, they do not possess the ability to hold nutrients. So oceanite, as you can see on the little cutout um, right there, is the perfect substrate for kelp holdfasts to attach to by satisfying the need for a secure anchoring point, which can withstand harsh ocean environments. Kelp holdfasts have a strong preference for robust yet porous surfaces, often choosing to settle along cold, rocky shorelines. Oceanite's complex system of pores creates more surface area per square inch, optimizing kelp settlement and the potential for kelp forests. I actually have a piece with me right here. Um, so if you can see all of the, you can see there's tons of holes and what you can't see, there's tons, there's many, many more tiny baby holes in here that the kelp holdfasts can go into and grab onto. Um, continuing, um, in the accompanying visuals, you will notice photos showcasing the growth of our kelp on our oceanite modules, which happened in an astonishingly short period, only about four months after deployment. This specific example originates from Halifax Harbor, a highly degraded cove situated within an industrial shipping district in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, the success of the kelp growth in Halifax Harbor at our restorative site exceeded our initial expectations. Um, using an underwater robotic camera, which is that black arm thing you see in these photos, um, We've observed the presence of multiple marine species, as you can see, circled in the top left photo. Um, we've seen crabs, sea stars, fish, and more. And notably, the sea stars have begun reproducing, um, resulting in an abundance of baby sea stars adorning our oceanite modules, which is just wonderful. Um, this remarkable outcome would not have been possible without the implementation of an intellar reef habitat. If our oceanite intellar reef modules can flourish in such a highly degraded, polluted harbor, it is a testament to their adaptability and effectiveness, making it suitable for various challenging marine environments worldwide. So, yeah. I could talk yes. about kelp all day, but um, that is, that's my little speech. Uh, so let me know if you have questions and I can try to answer them in the chat. And I, I think I pass it off to Tara now or back to Melody, I'm not sure. Thank you. Tara, go ahead. Hi, um, so that is my painting and I too could talk about kelp at length, but I'm not going to right now, not completely anyway. <laughs> Um, I am obsessed with restorative ocean farming. It is like my jam. It is something that I want to push Intella reefs into. And since we're so good at restoring kelp forests, there's no reason we shouldn't. Um, and falling in line with the idea of, you know, how to give mother ocean the tools to heal herself. 
I read this phenomenal book by a fisherman turned ocean farmer. And essentially what he thought was, what does the ocean want us to grow? Next slide. Um, and what he came up with was essentially a farm that mimics the ecosystem, but underwater. So it's a vertical garden, right? And this is, you can see from my illustration here, they're growing seaweed, oysters, clams, mussels, and scallops. This is a cold water ocean farm, like think Connecticut. Um, and the idea here is that this, this stuff grows here. You don't have to feed it. You don't have to water it. And you're creating habitat for juvenile fish, which is gonna spill over into the, for the local fishermen. Um, and there's no view shed concerns because above the water, you've just got some buoys, right? Um, and so it really is, what does the ocean want us to grow? It's, fish farming is a disaster. It is so hard to do that well. I haven't actually seen an example of it happening well yet. Um, maybe one day we'll figure that out. But you got to feed them, you got to deal with their poop, blah, blah, blah. This, you don't need to feed it. Um, and so anyway, kelp is also a huge carbon sink. Um, and the next slide uh, shows what I thought of for what we could do um, in a tropical um, restorative ocean farm. This was actually part of my research that I did while working for the Pacific community. I looked at their specific species that have biocultural values. What do they eat? What do they care about? They've got oysters, different kinds of seaweed, sea grapes, and those things that look like bread rolls are actually sea cucumbers, which like to live in sea grass. So in this way, we could have essentially a economic moment that is beneficial to the environment, right? We're harmonizing these activities. Seagrass is a huge carbon sink. Sea cucumbers have been shown to reduce ocean acidification. So if you put this kind of farm up current or next to protected coral reef, you're gonna also be reducing ocean acidification for that reef. And the people that live there will have food security and income. And you don't have to do this on a scale that's like global. The point of this is that it's local and it's benefiting local people and the local ecosystem, which has a huge spillover effect. Uh, one more slide over. This was my thought of how we could use Oceanite to do that while providing storm protection as having sort of like these little blocks. And I don't know if you can tell, but those on the bottom part are beach umbrellas. So I based this off of a sea cucumber farm happening in Madagascar. So you could not, you don't even need a boat to do this, right? Because that's a huge investment. So for communities that don't have a lot of funding, if we can put these little oceanite rooms, they can just walk out into the sea and harvest their sea cucumbers. Uh, so there's an option. And what I really hope people take away from this idea is the recognition that we are part of nature. Everything we do, everything we have, everything we do, it's all from nature. And all we have to do is think about how nature wants us to act. What does it want us to eat in this particular place? How does it want us to live? Because if we can harmonize our activity with nature, if we can be beavers, Tony, if we can be beavers, then we're not going to have that. That's earth law in practice. Okay. Also, I tried to answer a bunch of class questions on that sheet for you all. And I would love to answer further. So I'm going to give you all my email. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Tara and team Reef Life.